In our last episode, we brought you the story of Heather Teague's disappearance from Newburgh, Kentucky Beach on August 26, 1995. If you haven't listened to Heather Teague Part 1, which is our last episode, go back and listen before you get into this one because you will 100% be lost. Heather was a smart, beautiful 23-year-old who was sunbathing on that warm August day when a man emerged from the woods and dragged her away by her hair, never to be seen again. Initially, this seemed like a pretty open and shut case as a suspect was identified within a week. But when police went to serve a search warrant at the suspect, Marty Dill's home, he barricaded himself inside and shot himself. While many people considered the case effectively closed, considering Dill's suicide to be an admission of guilt, Heather has never been found and questions linger to this day. This week, we're going to be discussing some of the players in this decades-long saga, an alternate suspect, and Heather's mother, Sarah Teague's quest for justice. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Heather Teague. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. our first two-parter episode, so this is going to be a little bit different than usual. And I'd like to start off by thanking everyone for not only dealing with a two-part episode, but dealing with the delay. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Uh, It has been more than crazy here at our household. And um, yeah, I mean, we're not professional podcasters, so weirdly our jobs and our lives kind of got in the way here. Yeah, yeah. Well, in any case, we're here now, and we've got a lot to talk about today. The benefit of this delay, though, is that it's given a lot of people time to find the episode and contact us. And we've heard from several people with varying connections to this case, including from Heather's mother herself. As I've said before, we're not investigative journalists or detectives, and our goal here isn't to solve these cases— but to tell the stories of these missing people as thoroughly as we can so that their stories get out there as much as possible. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the whole point of this is, you know, to continue exposure uh, via any form of media for a missing person. Otherwise, you know, they just, the case just gets forgotten. Right. And that's the last thing that we want to happen because, you know, every single person that we've covered Their families deserve answers. They deserve to be found. Absolutely. When we left off last week, Marty Dill, the main suspect in Heather's disappearance, had been threatening to kill himself for a few days. Dill, if you'll recall, matched the composite sketch given by Tim Waffle, who was an eyewitness to Heather's abduction. He also drove a red and white Bronco, which was caught on video at the scene of the crime. On August 31st, Kentucky State Police, along with the FBI, went to Dill's trailer to execute a search warrant. Dill's father was in the trailer with him, and he came out. But before police went in, Dill shot himself. After the shot went off, a man came running out of the trailer. His name was Ernest Green, and he's Dill's uncle. Ernie was also a former Henderson police officer. After the gunshot, Green ran out of the trailer and told police that Dill had shot himself. Dill was brought to the hospital, where he later died from his injuries. I mentioned in the last episode, too, that there are many court documents and other public records located on the findheatherteague.com site. Among those are the notes from the search warrant that was executed after the standoff, and that's kind of where I want to pick up today. So we left off, basically, with the gunshot in the trailer, um, Green running out, Dill being taken to the hospital where he died. Um, But... Now I want to talk about what happened afterwards, um, which was that the police executed the search warrant that they came there with. Okay, because I still have so many questions about what actually happened in the trailer. But Oh, you're going to have even more. Great. Yeah, I, I'm not actually giving any <laughs> answers. I'm just giving more questions. Awesome. Yeah. So what we're going to be looking at now is a set of notes from KSP and a set from the FBI. 
Um, and as Becky Mash, who runs FindTetherTeague.com, points out, there's an interesting discrepancy between the two, and I want to get your take on this. All right, so in the FOIA request uh, is a handwritten document from Kentucky State Police of what was recovered from Dill's home on September 1st. Okay. All right, on this list, and this is verbatim, one driver's license, Marvin Dill, one hemostats. All right, and I'll, I'm going to stop right there because I didn't know what hemostats, like what that was. Um, do, do you know what that is? No. Okay, yeah. So I actually, I was writing this with my uh, when I was over at my sister's house, and she is going to get excited because she loves it when I mention her. But um, <laughs> I didn't know what she is, but she works in a dentist office, and they're like the little scissors, but they're clamps, and you use them um, oh. when you're suturing. Okay. Um, I don't necessarily think that's what Marty Dill was using it for because Marty Dill has an arrest record. A lot of it's for marijuana. Oh, it's a roach holder. I think it was a roach clip. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. But, you know, he missed stats. Okay. Now, it also says the next item is one picture in parentheses 35 millimeter. And I don't know what that means. Like, does that mean a negative? Because if it's just a picture, like, why would you say 35 millimeter? Uh, Is it a negative? Is it a roll of film? Like, I don't know. One picture parentheses 35 millimeter doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I I don't know what that means. Would yeah. be in reference to either. Yeah, so that's interesting. If it, if it was a developed photo, how would you know that it came from a, a 35, 35 millimeter, millimeter exactly. camera? It could have been anything. Right. Okay. Uh, the next item, one suicide note. Now, I have not seen anywhere where the contents of this suicide mm. note have been released. So just don't even ask because I have no idea. Okay. But apparently there was one, which is important. Yeah. The next item, one spent twenty two caliber casing. Hmm. One holster, six twenty-two caliber rounds. Okay. Now, the FBI report, which is typewritten, but was written just a few hours later, doesn't contain the full list of items removed from the home, but says this, quote, search of residence located 22 caliber revolver with one expended cartridge and three rounds, end quote. Okay, so the particular gun removed from Dill's home, was a Rome RG Model 66 single-action revolver. And those words mean literally nothing to me. (laughs) But you know guns, so I wanted to talk with you about this. And for those of you who may not know, like me, like can you just first, before we even get into it, just describe this gun? It's a Old West-style revolver. It's kind of touted as as like a like a cowboy style revolver. So it has uh, a, a pipe underneath the barrel that mm-hmm. you know back in the day when you used to be when you used to have to actually load your own ammo that would be used to tamp down the rounds and things like that. Obviously, that's not what it's used for now. Now it's just there. Um, but it's a revolver, so it's a six shot revolver. Single action means that they have to pull the hammer back. Every time they pull the trigger. So you can't just pull the trigger if the hammer isn't already cocked. Oh. So is this the kind of revolver with like a really weirdly long barrel? Yes. Okay. It's, so this it's a is cowboy a, gun. It's like a right, gun that right. you would see. It's a Yosemite Sam gun. Yes. That's, <laughs> Specifically. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's a cartoon Yosemite Sam gun. Okay. So this is not a revolver. So I know because you're. Your father was law enforcement, mm-hmm. and he carried a revolver for mm-hmm. a long time, right? He sure did. And because, you know, keep in mind, this is back in 95, and, like, that's the time your dad was working, too. So he had a revolver, but he didn't have not, a revolver. Not 95, but sure. <laughs> he, wasn't he still working in 95? Yeah, he didn't carry a revolver in 95. He carried a revolver in, like, the 70s. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I don't – listen, I already said I don't know about guns. Okay. But I do know he carried a revolver, but when he did, mm-hmm. as law enforcement, it wasn't – this type, I'm imagining, right? No, no, the, no. The, that's this. This type. Well, in particular, 22. 22s are very small bullets, right? Exactly. So they're they're not designed uh, for stopping power, which is what law enforcement carries, right? Okay, but let's get back to these two reports. Yeah. It's important to note that the KSP form doesn't indicate whether or not the six rounds were in the gun or not. Right. That's okay. Yeah. That's but, confusing to me because 
the cylinder of a revolver, in particular that model, only holds six rounds. Right. So the way it's written, it sounds like there's six rounds in the cylinder and then one spent cartridge. Right. And just, and is it possible in this type of gun to chamber a bullet? N- no. The, no. Yeah. Right. That's, the ch- the chamber is just the, the, where the, the, the cylinder is in reference to the barrel. But in for some, a revolver. in some types of guns, that's how you could get an those extra are, bullet are in there, right? Right. right. Yes. Those, so I'm the just kind, trying the to be with clear. The slide. Yeah. That yes. there's no way that there was ever seven bullets in this gun. Correct. Yeah. Okay. But like I said, they don't say that the six bullets were in the gun specifically. Right. But, you know, even if they weren't, I feel like six is still a really interesting number. And, okay, so if you were to buy a box of bullets for a twenty two revolver, like, how many would come in a box? Um, 50, probably. Yeah, right? I thought that it would be a lot. Yeah. So it's just weird to me that it's not more, that it's not less, that it's six. Right. Yeah, I guess I guess the report doesn't specifically say where the rounds were found. No, they, they were don't. found in the cylinder, if they were found next to the gun. Right. Because I mean it would also make sense to have bullets next to the gun as well, right? Like let's say the the gun wasn't loaded. Right. He got his bullets out, loaded the gun, he, you know, had the box of bullets or or whatever. Right. And there was just extra bullets. Exactly. There. Right. Yeah. Like I think that's completely reasonable. Sure. But they don't specify. And mm-hmm. so it just it seems weird, right? Like it just doesn't seem very clear. And now let's talk about the discrepancy between right. the two. Yeah. And so in the FBI report, they also say that there was only one expended cartridge. Mm-hmm. And that makes sense because, you know, there were a ton of people outside of this trailer and they all only heard one gunshot. Mm-hmm. Like there's no chance that there was more than one gunshot at right. that time. Um But the FBI report says that there were only three cartridges. The FBI report also doesn't specify if those rounds were found inside or outside of the gun. Right. Three would make sense, right? Like if you're just planning on killing yourself, maybe you don't need a fully loaded gun. You know, if there were three inside the gun or something like that. Or if there's one in the in the gun, three outside, fine. But I think it's just so weird that these two departments who are both there at the same time have very different stories of of the number of bullets recovered yeah you know and i think that's kind of an important thing to note when you're dealing with somebody who just died It, it just it just opens up a whole bunch of questions Right. Okay. I mean, because I mean, even even the way, like I said, even the way the KSP report was was written, mm-hmm. um, or the handwritten notes. I'm sorry, it's not an official report, but it's still the way it was written makes it sound as though there were seven bullets. And, right. And that's that's not so, possible. Correct. And and for anybody that doesn't understand how a revolver works, when you shoot it, expended cartridge stays in the cylinder. Oh. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't eject out of anywhere. That's not how a revolver works. Oh, so that's interesting because I was actually picturing an ejected a, a cartridge, cartridge. Laying next to the gun. Yeah. That's exactly what I was picturing. No, that's so the that's semi-automatic what... handgun that does that. Okay. A, re- so... a revolver, the bullets stay in the cylinder until you physically remove them. Then you're right. Then the way that report or not report, but the way that note the is note. written. Right really even more than I thought makes it sound like there are seven bullets. Right, because you wouldn't refer to an, a spent cartridge as an additional round. So you would write it as one expended cartridge plus five additional rounds. Huh. Okay, so you would never refer to an expended cartridge as a round. So this is just to go back to exactly what they said. Yeah, what, it, what, it, what was it? One spent cartridge. 22 caliber casing. Okay. Six 22 caliber rounds. So that to me sounds like there's seven bullets present. I'm sorry, six rounds, six live rounds, Mm -hmm. and one spent. 
And this type of in the gun, then that's too. This type of revolver does not have a cylinder that holds seven. There are ty- there are some types of revolvers that hold seven rounds. Yeah, this is not one of them. So what's so weird to me is then that whether this was just an innocent mistake or something weirder, why wouldn't the FBI report just right. say six? Right. Like, why would they then say four? Basically, yeah. Like, where did where did the other two possibly three yeah. rounds go? Yeah, this it's uh, that discrepancy. It just opens up a whole host of questions. Did they fingerprint the suicide note? Not to my knowledge. Okay, and we already went over. They didn't do at least not to your knowledge. They didn't do GSR. No, on on either the, Dill or Ernest Green. Right. Why? The kindest, most innocuous explanation is they said, this is a suicide. This is a guilty man who killed himself rather than facing justice for his crimes. Open and shut case. Everybody go home. You have to do your due diligence. There was somebody else in the trailer with them. Yeah. And that's why, to me... And a simple discre- GSR test would, would would just immediately prove one way or that the it other. was a suicide. Exactly. Yeah. As open and shut as a suicide may seem, and as suicides go, like, I get it, but I feel like any time you have a suicide where somebody else is in the room, you can't just make that assumption. Right. Even if, like Marty Dill... They had been threatening it for days. Right. Because you don't know what actually happened in that moment. And to not do any sort of investigation other than, you know, I guess just asking like, hey, did he kill himself? Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's not enough. Correct. There's there's holes in this. So this brings us to Ernest Green. We got to dive into this guy a little bit. Green, as I mentioned, was Marty Dill's uncle. Presumably, he and Marty's father were at the trailer that night to try to kind of talk Marty down. Because like I said, he had been saying he was going to kill himself. Like, you know, everybody by that time knew that Marty was a suspect in Mm -hmm. Heather T's disappearance. So it kind of seems like they were closing rings trying to help him out. I read some things about Green kind of out of order. So his whole deal has been a little confusing to me. But... As I mentioned, he was a former local police officer. But even that is kind of a little misleading. When Green retired in 1984, he was a major in the Henderson Police Department. Okay, so he's pretty far up there. Yeah, like that's, I don't don't know, I'm not great at ranks, but like that seems high. But despite this high rank, Green didn't exactly have a spotless career. In 1967, he arrested an 18-year-old man named Danny Lee Lawson for public intoxication. Now, this sounds to me like a pretty minor crime, and I would assume that a local cop would basically have a ton of these arrests under his belt. Um, But for whatever reason, this particular one did not go well. According to the lawsuit that he later filed, Lawson alleges that basically, you know, he ran from Green, which, okay, you can say don't run from the police, but this was an 18-year-old kid who was drunk and probably not about making good decisions, you know? And when you're a drunk 18-year-old, like, isn't running from the cops just kind of what you do? (laughs) I mean, I'm not going to say anything to that one way or the other, so... (laughs) Regardless, here's where it gets crazy. Lawson alleged that Green fired at him three times, which running or not, like, why would you ever shoot at somebody who you're trying to arrest for public intoxication? When when was this? What 67. Year was this? 1985 was Tennessee versus Garner. Mm-hmm. So nearly 20 years after this. Yeah, that made it to the Supreme Court. And the ruling was you can't shoot a fleeing felon unless they present uh, a clear danger to themselves or, or society at large. Um, so like in 67, was it just a free for all? That's really <laughs> kind of 
I, it, that depends on the state, honestly. Because it, um, I mean, it still sounds. I mean, you know, I'll believe I don't, anything, but like, I, I, I don't want to quote anything. You know, don't don't quote me on that. That's where that's where I'm hung up on. Yeah, like, like it's not like he robbed if it a was store. A, right, if it was whatever. like a fleeing felon, mm-hmm. then certain states did have yeah, uh, you know, rules in place or laws in place where where that was okay. Yeah, so I don't know, so, but. Like, but it it gets worse. So after he shoots at him three times, um, you know. Allegedly. Yes. After he allegedly shoots at him three times. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Lawson, who was running before, like, is definitely running. And he actually goes underneath a pickup truck to hide. And Green finds him and basically pulls him out and just beats the shit out of him. He was then taken to the Henderson City holdover, which I'm guessing basically means like a drunk tank or, you know, I'm or like kind of I'm picturing Mayberry, you know, where the police station has two jail cells. Uh, yeah, maybe. You uh, know, just something along those I've, I've lines. I've never heard the technical term as of a uh, drunk tank being called a, what was it, a holdover? holdover? Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I'm maybe that's something that does exist either there or did exist back then. Yeah. And But from there, he was transported to the Henderson County Jail, where he claims that he was assaulted again and denied a phone call in violation of his 14th Amendment rights. Well, this was the 60s. Well, yeah, for sure. So Lawson filed a suit in federal court against Green asking for $25,000 in damages. And again, this was 1967, so in today's dollars, that was almost 200000 And I couldn't find any information about the outcome of the suit, though. Mm -hmm. But considering that Green eventually became a major in the Henderson City Police Department, which is where he was working at the time, um, it doesn't seem to have negatively affected him too much. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, so he retired in 19... I don't know his exact age, but he retired in 1984. Um, You know, this happened in 1967 when presumably he was like a beat cop or, you Mm -hmm. know, something like that. So the point is, is that, you know, presumably early on in his career, he was shown to have a propensity for violence at the very least. But that wasn't the only time Green would find himself in professional hot water either. So in 1984, then Major Green was one of three men named in a federal bias complaint filed with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Ann Bickett was Henderson's only female police officer at the time. And, you know, as you can imagine, she did not, in fact, have an easy go of it. Right. Her complaint alleged sexual discrimination and accused a fellow officer of six counts of sexual harassment. An internal investigation dismissed those counts, but found him responsible for one count of sexual misconduct, which resulted in a 15-day suspension without pay. You know, so that fight started kind of at the city level, right? Like, um, that was her first go-to. But after she only had the one officer receive a 15-day suspension, you know, she was not happy. And so she was planning on, that's when she took it to the EEOC and, you know, was possibly going to file a, a federal lawsuit mm-hmm. against the police department. But seeing the writing on the wall... I guess both Green and the the chief at the time uh, retired instead of dealing with it. Mm. So they never had to go through an investigation or, you know, any of that. After their retirement and the other officer's suspension, Officer Bickett was rehired. Green doesn't pop back up in the news, though, until Dill's death in 1995. But... All right, remember how I told you some people who are connected to this case, you know, in weird ways got in contact with me? Yeah. One of them was somebody who's related to Ernie Green. Mm. And they didn't want me to give out any identifying details beyond that, but said, quote, I was very young when he left the police, but I've been told lots of stories about him being a dirty cop. Definitely a womanizer to this day. I've asked him about that day, meaning the day that Marty died. Yeah. And he literally will not answer me, just changes the subject. I've always believed there's more to it, but I don't know what that is. End quote. The person went on to say that Green has always been kind to them, Mm -hmm. um, but that they do know he has a temper and that they personally know that he has beaten his wife more than once. 
And this person was talking to another relative, and that relative says that they believe it's possible that Marty didn't actually shoot himself. Well, this is all conjecture. Oh, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I mean, it's all hearsay. Like, none of this is evidence. None of this is. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it. That's important to note. And, you know, I do want to thank that family member for getting in touch with us and talking about this. And the fact that a different family member believes that Marty may not have killed himself is interesting, obviously, because that theory also came up while I was initially researching this case. Back to those police and FBI documents on findheatherteague.com. They're pretty hard to read because they're all really heavily redacted, Mm -hmm. almost to a ridiculous extent. For instance, there's an FBI interview from September 21st, 2005, which is right around the 10-year anniversary Mm -hmm. after Heather's abduction, where a redacted witness mentions that redacted was in the trailer with Marty Dill at the time of his suicide in 1995. But the fact that Ernie Green was there and he was the one, I mean, that was in the newspaper in 1995. Like, that was public public knowledge knowledge the day it happened, basically. Um, So, like, redacting that doesn't – whatever. But so, anyway, here's what the section says. And I, you know, I kept the redactions that I don't know what was redacted. But the ones where it's obviously referring to Ernie, I just replaced with his name. The witness – you know, which is just the person's name redacted. So the witness has known Ernest Green, former Henderson Police Department redacted for many years. She noted that Ernest had a bad reputation as an redacted and possessed an extremely violent personality. The witness has always been troubled by the fact that Ernie was with Marty Dill at the time Dill allegedly committed suicide. End quote. All of these questions around that could have been easily taken care of right with with simple tests yeah at the time and it, yeah an actual investigation right you know because this interview was 10 years later we're talking about this 25 years later right and maybe we wouldn't have to right you know so all of this tracks with what the family member told me about green just a few weeks ago If you remember way back in the beginning of our first episode on this case, I mentioned possible government corruption, drugs, and prostitution. Right. And these FBI interviews from 2005 are where a lot of that comes in. In another interview in December of 2005, Green seemingly comes up again. The same phrase is used again, bad reputation. This statement says that at the time of Heather's kidnapping, this person was involved in the redacted drug ring. The paragraph goes on to echo the September statement that they strongly doubt that Dill committed suicide because Redacted was in the trailer. Since we know Ernie was in the trailer, and this is in the same paragraph as the comment about the drug ring, I think it's reasonable to assume that this witness statement claims that in 1995, Ernest Green was involved in a local drug ring. My head's exploding right now. (laughs) But that's not all this witness statement says. It also mentions that a prostitute was found dead a few years prior with a needle in her arm, but it was never reported in the local papers. The witness believes that it was a cover-up. The person goes on to state that they believe many Henderson officials strongly enforce methamphetamine violations in order to protect their own cocaine business. Hmm. Yeah. So... That's and that's kind of one actually one of the first things that I read was this alleged kind of accusation that the Henderson police basically did have a drug ring and that it was cocaine and that they would go after people who were selling meth, especially hard because they wanted to protect their business. So while all of this is pretty clearly hearsay, I mean, it is an actual FBI witness interview. You know, it's not just some crazy person just telling stories at a bar or anything like that. And, I mean, it just seems as though there are a lot of fishy things going on in Henderson, Kentucky. 
And honestly, there is actually a lot more to this whole drug prostitution angle, but that's just an entire other rabbit hole. Um, but for those who are listening who may be local to Henderson, Uncle Sam's Strip Club does feature prominently in this. Hmm. And basically, you know, there are allegations that prostitution was being run, run out of the strip club along with drugs and there was distribution and all this kind of stuff. And there were public officials involved. It's just a whole big mess. So at this point, we have Ernest Green, former Henderson police officer who is known to be violent and was possibly involved in a drug ring in the trailer when Marty Dill committed suicide. And, you know, like we said, when you have more than one person in a room, it should not be an open and shut case. Okay, so neither one of them was tested for gunshot residue, but you could be saying Green was his uncle. Marty was acting super guilty. He drove a red, red and white Bronco. You know, and yes, like, all of this is true. I'm not here to say that Marty's some innocent guy who was framed or anything like that. But what I am saying is that something stinks. Right. And that something goes all the way back to the composite sketch. All right, let's let's hear it. In the last episode, we played Tim Waffles' call to report the abduction and his description of the abductor. And, you know, just to refresh your memory, we're going to play that section again. What did he look like? He was kind of heavy set. Uh, he just had like a, a blue jean uh, cut off pants on and tennis shoes. And it looked, I couldn't tell if he had a full beard or if he just had real shaggy hair and, or something over his face. But you couldn't what color is his hair, sir? Kind of uh, dark brown. Was he white or black? He was white. White male? Yeah. And he had a gun with him? Yes, sir. Did he, he have a shirt on? Nope, no shirt. He had to what appeared to be like it was a chrome plated because it kept glistening in the sun. Possibly a bushy beard uh-huh. or long, shaggy hair, uh-huh. or as you pointed out when we were listening, something obscuring his face. Uh huh. One of the police reports said that this description matched Dill's driver's license photos. So that is what partially led them to being able to secure that search warrant. But then there's this weird thing about the wig and the mosquito netting that came out well after this initial call. Yeah, and we don't know where that description actually We came don't from. exactly know the origin of that. And it's just so weird, all right? Because, yes, he does say, or something on his face, and you say, okay, that can mean a mosquito net. I just think there's no universe in which that can mean a mosquito net. That just seems... Why? I just feel like you don't think that a mosquito neck is a net is a beard or bushy long shaggy hair but he wasn't immediately on him or close to him i mean i get that he was looking through a telescope but this is you know an altercation that happens very quickly and maybe he didn't get a good look through the telescope it seemed like he did, though, but he was explaining it. He was describing it very confidently. You know, I don't know. The mosquito net thing just still seems nuts to me. But, okay, put that aside. What about the wig? He didn't say. Right. The wig. But the description so where does the wig said come a wig and a mosquito but net. But where does the wig right? come Where? Well, as Heather's mother, Sarah Teague, found out in 2015, there could be a very good reason why this whole wig mosquito net thing kind of came out later. Mm. All right. Marty Dill, as we said, was not a good dude. And he was actually put in jail three times in 1995 prior to Heather's disappearance. In 2015, Sarah Teague obtained Dill's booking info for all three of those arrests. Dated April 25th, April 28th, and May 24th. And keep in mind, so the last one's May 24th. Heather goes missing August 26th. So we're talking almost exactly three months. And I, I'm actually going to show these to you real quick so that you can take a look and tell me if you notice anything. Okay, so right now you're looking at his booking information for those three 1995 arrests. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, bald, bald, and bald. Yeah. He was bald. So his driver's license photo, which was taken, you know, who knows when, exactly matched the um, composite sketch. But that's not what Barney Dill looked like at the time of Heather Teague's disappearance. Was he wearing a wig? How would a witness know that? It's 
to me and to a the, lot of people. The witness didn't say it, at well, least not on you, the 911 call. Exactly. We don't know that he didn't say it because, you know, while I don't have any record of Tim Waffle saying, like, yes, it was a wig, I do have him saying years later that he believes it was Marty Dill that he saw on the beach. So that would lead you to believe that he did think he was wearing a wig or something. The point is, to me, what this sounds like is they're reverse engineering a description to ma- to to match a suspect. Right. Okay, but we do know that Marty was in that area because his 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 Bronco was captured. On, yeah, on video footage. It absolutely was, and, so, and it was his dad's Bronco, but it was the Bronco that he drove. Right. So we know he was in the area mm-hmm. for sure. For reasonable, I mean, I don't think we know anything for sure, honestly. Okay, that's but true. I think yes, it's it's pretty reasonable to say that yes, Marty Dill was in the area. You know, okay, so let's just say he's wearing, he's in the area, decides to go abduct Heather from the beach wearing a wig and a mosquito net maybe mm-hmm. i mean sure okay but you know i personally don't see the wisdom in taking great pains to conceal your identity with a wig and a mosquito net which would definitely make you stick out like a sore thumb but then you know also driving your dad's red and white bronco to the crime scene and like parking next to your victim's car in the parking lot um but you know i'm not a criminal so like who knows um, but, you know, I do think we need to point out that at no point was a wig or a mosquito net ever recovered from Marty's car or house or anywhere. At, at least not in, the, in any of the documents you found. No. And right. I think that, like, if it a wig or a mosquito net, I mean, there. you know. <laughs> well, I mean, was he, was he known to wear a wig? I've never seen anything that would indicate that. Or was he just, like, a, you know, confident bald guy? Well, I mean, I don't know that he was bald, like, as in he lost his hair. I mean, it could, he could be bald as in he shaved it off. Oh, yeah. I guess. Yeah. It does just say bald. Yeah, I don't think they, like, go into the nuances of, yeah, yeah. you know, your haircut on a booking photo. Um, yeah, so I don't know. But all I know is that in May of 1995, three months almost to the day before Heather disappeared, the police said he was bald. Hey everyone, have you ever wondered about the official narrative of certain famous crime stories? Did you ever suspect the public wasn't getting the whole truth? If I mention the name Charles Manson, I bet the first words that come to mind are Helter Skelter. The motive used to convict Manson and his cult of the murder of 10 innocent people, including actress Sharon Tate. But what if there was more to this story? What was Helter Skelter? Was it really the reason that the murders were committed? In her true crime book, The Manson Family, More to the Story, author H. Allegra Lansing has laid out a chronology of the Manson family history that gives a more transparent understanding of why the killings happened and what we can still learn from these events all these years later. The Manson Family, More to the Story, is available on Kindle, Nook, and in paperback through Amazon, or you can listen to the audiobook by visiting mansonfamily.net. Now we're going to get to the part that I know is going to frustrate some listeners because I'm just going to drop a whole lot of stuff on you that I don't have good answers for. I mean, how like I'm even going to introduce whole new characters that we haven't even heard of at this point. Oh, goody. Yeah. In 2005, the FBI came to town and did a new round of interviews, like we mentioned before, because despite the fact that the case was effectively closed, it wasn't actually closed. And there's still clearly a lot of questions surrounding Heather's disappearance, and some threw the original narrative into question. By 2004, if not earlier, another name was coming up in Heather's disappearance, Christopher Below. Below was also a Henderson native whose girlfriend, Catherine Fetzer, disappeared in 1991. In 2003, he confessed to shooting her and dumping her body in a trash bin. 
Below is currently in prison for this crime, despite the fact that Fetcher's body was never found. And, you know, on the surface, this crime doesn't appear to have much to do with Heather, except for the fact that he is a person of interest in at least three other murders Mm -hmm. of women. While there doesn't appear to be any hard evidence to currently support this, investigators say that Below has the traits of a serial killer. Medina, Ohio detective Scott Thomas considers Below to be a person of interest in Heather's case for a few reasons. Both Heather and Below's victim, Catherine Fetzer, looked a lot alike. They were both pretty brunettes around 5 feet tall and 100 pounds. And I have seen pictures of them side by side and yeah, like they could have been sisters. Below was also in Henderson at the time of Heather's disappearance, though he did move away shortly thereafter, allegedly on the day Marty Dill died. Mm. Plus, he and Heather had acquaintances in common. Do we have a description for Below? Oh yeah, actually, I've got a photo, so let me just show this to you. Okay, so this is a picture of Christopher Below. Oh, are you kidding me? (laughs) Okay, long hair, scruffy beard. Yeah. I mean, come on. Yeah. And again, I don't know exactly when that photo was taken. So I cannot say that that's what he looked like at At the the time. time. So some believe that Below, not Dill, may have actually been the person on the beach who grabbed Heather. There's also the theory that Below and Dill worked together, that one man grabbed her and the other drove the car, which would have made for a much easier getaway and would explain why the person who was on the beach had hair and Marty Dill's car was there. Right. Because it was more than one person. Did they have any connection or is that just theory? Well, I apparently they do have, again, just kind of loose acquaintance-type connections. Though Below did admit to killing Fetzer, he has never led investigators to her body, nor has he ever admitted to playing a role in Heather's abduction. And he's actually set for release for uh, Fetzer's murder next year in November of 2021. Well, then he's definitely not going to talk on anything. Mm-mm. The lingering question of Below's possible involvement is probably part of what led the FBI to come back in 2005, because this is right after that happened. Mm -hmm. But the FBI also returned in 2009. And at this point, they spoke with Sarah Teague, which brought about what to me is one of the weirdest parts of this case, you know, other than the mosquito net and the guy with the telescope, of course. Like, everything about this case is weird. Two FBI agents came to visit Sarah, Jerry Garner and James Hendricks. In a strange turn of events, and I, because I don't know honestly if we can even call it a coincidence, James Hendricks, one of the FBI agents, was a beat officer for the Henderson Police Department in 1995. Interesting. Yeah. Not only that, he had encountered Heather prior to her disappearance. Hmm. And the whole purpose of this visit to Sarah's house, basically to dispel rumors that James Hendricks, an FBI agent assigned to this cold case, had a relationship with Heather before she was abducted. Where are these rumors coming from? Was it coming from mom? I've got a transcript from the interview. Okay. All right. I'm not going to read the entire transcript, but I mean a good chunk of it because there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. James Hendricks open, opens this. And so, by the way, um, I believe that Sarah Teague recorded this interview, which is how we have a transcript. James Hendricks, listen, I know you heard rumors and stuff through the grapevine, and it's gotten back to me. And I just wanted to set your mind at ease. That big rumor that was I'd seen her on the day before her abduction. That's not true. It was about three weeks prior to her abduction. And then he goes on to say, I'd gone through the park earlier. There was no cars there. I came through this time. There was a car. The best of my recollection, it was a small red car. And it didn't look like there was anybody in it. But I signed out with my dispatcher walked over with my flashlight, looked in, and there was Heather. She was asleep. Sarah says she was asleep. James Hendricks says, yes, ma'am. And um, it startled me a little bit, one, to see anybody in the car, and two, to see some young woman 
She was very sweet, very cooperative, said she had a fight with her parents. Ran her ID. We didn't have any warrants on her. Just one, two, uh, I gave her a little bit of a lecture that she shouldn't be out there. She shouldn't be sleeping in her car at two and three in the morning, especially underneath the boat ramp. She was very cooperative. And then Sarah asks, did she leave or did she just stay there? James replies, so I said, you need, you know, get on out of here. And she said, okay. So I drove on through the park and I look over my shoulder and her car is still sitting there and the headlights weren't on. I said, well, she hasn't left yet. So I drove down the street about a half hour later. I came back and she wasn't there. She wasn't doing anything illegal. Sarah says, so you didn't know Heather before? You had never met Heather before? James Hendricks, no, it just stood out to me, you know, a young girl in a car and the name just stood out to me. And then about three weeks later is when it hit me. I realized that was the Heather I'd encountered. And then Sarah basically asks him why he didn't make a report. And he says, because there wasn't nothing to report. You know, we come across people throughout our patrol shifts in the day and there's nothing to report. She wasn't doing anything illegal. And then Sarah says, yeah, I mean, after she was abducted, though. Hendrick says, again, that wasn't relevant. Her sleeping in her car three weeks prior wasn't relevant to what was going on. I, I, I'm still confused as to why this FBI agent felt the need to, like, officially come down and talk to Heather's mom about this. 15 years. 15 years later. Yeah. Why? I don't know. And presumably he wasn't even living like in Kentucky or anything at this point. Um, You know, he was with the FBI and somehow got assigned to this case. And yeah, came to Sarah Teague's house apparently just to say like, oh, hey, you heard that I saw her the night before she was abducted. It was actually three weeks ago. Unless this came up during another interview that he was doing with Sarah to get further background on the case or something like that. I I just can't, I just don't understand like why he would go out of his way to come to Kentucky to say, hey, I, I saw her three weeks prior, not the night before. Yeah. Well, what's interesting, too, is that after this, Sarah brings up uh, a possibility that Heather may have been working with the police in some respect. And, you know, Sarah says, going back to my notes, there seems to be some information that Heather may have worked with police. And that is why she was either taken out of here or was killed. But then, you know, Hendrick says he has no knowledge of any of that. And then Jerry Garner, interestingly, the other FBI agent who's there, kind of interjects at this point just to say, like, hey, by the way, there's no government corruption in this. So, like, if that's what you're thinking, don't think that because there isn't any. So, like, it's it's a really weird kind of almost, like, scrambling to just say nobody brought up government corruption up to that point. Right. I mean, other than the fact that, you know, Sarah was clearly a little suspicious of Hendricks, and he did tell her at another point in this interview that, like, when he was in the police department, there weren't any investigations around him or anything like that. Yeah, but basically, just later on in the interview, Hendricks just kind of talks about how people have been talking, and, you know, he says... And that just kind of bothered me a little bit. And all the conspiracy theories that I was somehow involved in this, it really bothered me. He's randomly assigned to this cold case. Mm Mm-hmm. And he just happens to be from the area. I guess. Or perhaps the FBI assigned it to him because he might have some knowledge of the area. Sure. But then he hears a rumor or whatever, here's it through some grapevine that Sarah Teague wants to talk to him? Yeah, and that, like, she thinks that he was with Heather the night before her disappearance. Because basically, I mean, all right, so night before, three weeks before, whatever, the fact is that after Heather disappeared, he never apparently brought any of this up, Mm -hmm. right? Like, so, because she says, like, hey, so why, okay, if you didn't report it, at the time, because he didn't think it was important, like, why didn't you say anything once she disappeared? And he still says, because I don't think it's relevant. But, you know, again, missing persons case, I kind of feel like everything's worth mentioning, you know? 
Okay, so Sarah has basically been conducting her own investigation for the past 25 years, and somebody who was friends with Heather made this statement to her. Quote, we all decided to go to Redacted to party. That's when we noticed that James and Heather showed up at the same time, which I thought was odd, him being an off-duty cop and wanting to come party with our group of friends. But he brought the liquor and pot, so he really didn't give it a second thought. We didn't have to pay for it, so it was okay. But James never let the girls out of his sight. He was always close by. James Hendrick. Mm-hmm. And then this friend of Heather's goes on to say... Quote, the night before August 26th, so this is where this whole, like, night before okay. thing comes on in. The night before August 26th, we were all at Newburgh Beach. That is the night that everyone there seen the fight between Marty Dill and Ernest Green. Blood was drawn between the two over some kind of money, and Marty told Ernest to just go to his house and wait for him there, and he would bring him the money. That's when I asked Redacted, quote, what money are they fighting about? Of course, Redacted brushed it off as drug money, probably. That's when Heather told us she was doing side jobs for James to make some extra money, and she didn't want to tell us the rest and didn't want us to get in any type of trouble. There were several occasions when Heather would meet James at Hayes Boat Ramp by Atkinson Park to talk about the next job or jobs he had for her to do. Some of the jobs would be dancing for private parties with Redacted. I would never go because I didn't feel comfortable Redacted or doing drug runs for James, end quote. There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack. So, you know, I think it's interesting when Sarah was talking to the FBI agent, she kind of like, she kept it very like, oh, I heard she was doing some work with the police, yeah. you know, to make it seem kind of official. But based on, you know, what Sarah already knew because of this, or, you know, or believed. I mean, because, again, we don't know what is real here. Right. But, you know, what she believed based on this statement is that, you know, she wasn't working for the police. She, she was, was working, working for James. James. First off, let's say good job on Sarah Teague's part mm -hmm. for being so thorough with the investigation and for not showing her hand mm -hmm. at this point. Like, yeah. That's, that's a pretty good. That's a pretty good job. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. Because, you know, when I read it before I read that statement, like, I absolutely thought, like, oh, like, yeah, you know, there's all this drug stuff. Like, maybe was some, she was some sort of CI or, you know, whatever. And that statement does, does not make it seem as though she's a CI. No, yeah. no. I mean, it seems like it goes back to the drugs and, you know, at least private dancing, possible prostitution, who knows. Right. But, again, a, a very seedy underbelly of Henderson, Kentucky, that involves the police mm -hmm. and, you know, potential public officials. A lot of accusations there. Yeah, there's um, a lot. And, and that's why I think it's important to also look a little bit more like we did with Ernest Green, you know, kind of dig in a little bit more into James Hendricks and who he is. Mm-hmm. So as I mentioned, Hendricks, you know, wasn't even in Kentucky at this time. I don't know exactly where he was in 2009, but at some point, and it could be at this point, he was actually at Quantico here in our neck of the woods. And I believe he actually came down to the D.C. area like in the late 90s, early 2000s, kind of in that in that range. Um, and so he stayed there for a while before moving up to New York in 2018 and being named special agent in charge of the Albany FBI office, mm. which, you know, that's a big deal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, uh -oh, uh, Hendricks left that job and the FBI just two years later. According to an article in the Times Union from September 8th, 2020, Hendricks was the subject of an internal investigation that found that, quote, he sexually harassed eight subordinate employees and created a hostile work environment for another employee with whom he had had an intimate relationship, end quote. So the FBI has a policy against naming agents who are involved in cases like this. But Brendan Lyons, who wrote this article, says that they were able to independently confirm that the ousted agent was Hendricks. Mm. And kind of hilariously, um, at least one of the sources appears to be the Department of Justice itself. The DOJ's Office of the Inspector General posted the investigative summary in May of 2020 to Oversight.gov. And 
the report was very careful in accordance with policy to not name names. Mm-hmm. It just said, you know, an agent in the Albany office, da 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 da. But well, <laughs> the page is just a Microsoft Word document that was converted to a PDF and then uploaded. So when you go to the page, it still has the original file name, which is Hendrix Investigative Summary dot docx. Oh wow. I mean, by far not, you know, the most important part of this case, but kind of the most hilarious. Uh, <laughs> it just wow. But what what's amazing <clears throat> is that you can still go there today and it still says that. And it was uploaded in May. Well, yeah, well, because it's uploaded. So now it's now it's just there. And that, now it's out of the out of the control of the DOJ. No, you think you can fix that? You can change a file name. Are you kidding me? You can absolutely fix that in four seconds. Okay. Yeah. Well, they obviously don't know. That. Or yeah, I don't know. So um so yeah, so anyway, uh it's interesting when I was looking at several of the articles about this um thing in Albany, you know, the first couple are like an unnamed agent, blah 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 blah. But then very quickly several are like, it's James Hendrix. Um so yeah, they were able to tell. So okay. Much like Ernie Green, Hendrick's career also ended because of a sex scandal. Mm -hmm. But if you're listening to this and going crazy because we're just going down rabbit hole after rabbit hole, I mean, trust me, I get it. But imagine being Sarah Teague. You know, imagine spending 25 years tirelessly pursuing justice for your missing daughter only to be met with all of this. Yeah. And I'm sure there's avenues that we haven't even explored. Oh, there are a million of them. Yeah. Yeah. In 2013, frustrated by stonewalling and misinformation, Sarah Teague filed a lawsuit against the Kentucky State Police. In Teague v. KY State Police, she not only names KSP, but Henderson Police and 21 other individuals, including James Hendricks and Tim Waffle, the witness, you know, with the telescope. Yeah. Now, the suit was dismissed, but it's still an interesting read. In it, Sarah lays out the evidence she says she's gathered that proves the story she was told about Heather's disappearance in 1995 is a lie. And it is easy to dismiss kind of what she's saying because the lawsuit ultimately didn't go anywhere. But it's important to note that Sarah didn't have a lawyer. She filed this pro se. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the reasons it was dismissed was procedural Procedural reasons. Like uh, some of the things were just outside of the statute of limitations. It was things like that, right? And Mm -hmm. it just, it didn't have the focus it needed to. It was basically, um, you know, it was 25 years of every things she had learned just kind of in one document Mm -hmm. and it just wasn't where it legally needed to be you know so you know this is what i'm going to say to wrap this up several people have gotten in touch with me like i said since we aired our first episode on this including sarah teague herself and you know that is some somebody who i do want to talk more with and and hopefully have her on the show you know so we can actually discuss what she's been going through and, and you know what she thinks The other call to action that I have is that Sarah needs a lawyer on her side. If any of you listening are a lawyer or know someone who is and would be willing to help her, please contact her directly or contact us and we'll get the information to her. Her contact info will be at the end of this episode. Heather has been gone now for over 25 years. Like we need to get some answers. Yeah. I mean, there are so many questions. Yeah. Just so many unanswered questions. Yeah. And and interestingly, so I was talking when I was finishing up the script because I was trying to verify something in one of those FBI reports that I thought could be referring to, to Ernest Green. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was, I contacted that family member again, just to see if they could shed some light on it and they couldn't, but you know, we're just kind of talking because they still live in Henderson. And, you know, they said that there are at least like half a dozen unsolved missing and murdered cases that at least even that they know of. And, and it's a lot for such a small town. So it's not, this was in 1995, but something is still going on there. And, and they said that it's still very much a good old boy network and it's all about who, you know, you know, and, and what you could get away with. The thing too, is that Sarah has heard 
so many stories over the years about right. what happened to Heather. Heather is alive. She's in witness protection. She's been sold into a sex ring. She was fed to hogs. Like, everything you can think of, somebody has told Sarah yeah. at this point. And she deserves real answers, you know? She doesn't deserve just hearsay or made up stories or anything like that. I mean, she needs somebody who can help her figure out what exactly was going on here because I don't know what happened to Heather that day on Newburgh beach, but what I do not believe after having, you know, looked into all this and read everything that I've read, I do not believe that Marty Dill woke up that morning and just got in his Bronco and randomly decided to pick Heather Teague up by the hair and take her into the woods. I do not think that this is just some crazy guy who decided to abduct a young woman. I think that there's more, and I don't know what that more is. I don't know if the more is he had an accomplice. I don't know if there's this drug connection, if Heather needed to be gone because she had gotten involved in some stuff, or she knew stuff she shouldn't know, or what it was, but I do not for a second believe that this is your typical random abduction case. There's there's too many questions there. Yeah. I mean, you know, you never want to refer to a, a an abduction case as typical, but this is just so big. And yeah. it goes down so many different directions. So while this is the conclusion of our two-part episode on Heather Teague, I fully expect that we will revisit this Absolutely. at some point in some way, because there's just so much going on here. Um, so if you're out there and you have information about this case, like definitely report it to the authorities. But if you have background information to add or just something that, you know, you think is minor, you can contact us on Facebook, Instagram, or on our website. If you don't want to write something, if you just want to say something, um, you can actually also go to our blog. I'll put the link up, but it's anchor.fm slash and then they were gone slash message. And you can leave a voicemail for us and we could possibly play it on a future episode. Danielle Teague has been missing since August 26, 1995. She would be 48 years old today. If you have any information about what may have happened to her, please contact the Kentucky State Police at 270-826-3312. You can also speak directly with Heather's mother, Sarah Teague, at 270-824-8343. You can see all of the sources for this episode, along with photos and videos on our website, and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social. And then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five-star review on Apple podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And this is our season one finale. So we want to thank every single one of you who has been with us on this experimental journey so far. Um, this is our 17th episode. And like I mentioned before, we are going to be doing kind of follow-ups, some bonus episodes, some kind of different things, maybe some interviews. Um, but uh, yes, and then we will be back with a season two that is you know, back to the original format with new cases of missing people. Thank you so much for listening and following us. Thank you. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you could do it!